огромнейшее э, счастье у вас побыть сегодня. Э, я думаю, что когда придумали кейс, они, наверное, думали а, обо мне, потому что как раз Украина, Беларусь, э, Литва, они э, все части моей жизни, моей научной жизни, и с, уже с прошлого года еще и Молдова, хотя я сегодня о Молдове не буду говорить, так что это просто прекрасное даже не совпадение, а судьба. Говорить я буду по-английски, потому что я, я даже не знала, что у нас вообще будет по-русски, но э, обсуждение, конечно, мы можем вести на русском языке, на украинском. Я тоже э, хорошо понимаю по-белорусски, так что э, общаться можно и надеюсь, что будет э, возможность. Я очень рада, что здесь э, столько представителей э, молодых поколений, э, издавателей. Я очень рада э, с вами общаться буду э, и, может быть, наши дороги еще в будущем будут пересекаться. Но говорить я буду по-английски, извините, надеюсь, что это не будет слишком трудно или слишком теоретично. Um, my presentation today is part of a larger project, and in part, uh, part of uh, one book I will be publishing this year, which is called uh, The Politics of Energy Dependency, Ukraine, Belarus and Lithuania between domestic oligarchs and Russian power. Um, uh, It will be published by the University of Toronto Press later this year, it's already written. Um, this project is a response to what I believe are uh, very serious problems in the conventional narrative of Russian energy relations with energy poor states. And what does this conventional narrative tell us? The conventional narrative tells us is an external issue. It's an issue of supplies, of the role of the suppliers. So the conventional narrative has focused on that supply process and on Russia's ability to use that supply process as a means for political influence. Um, I agree that such external elements are very important, and I think we could talk the whole day about how Russia is using those pipelines and that political influence for political goals. I know that. Uh, we can talk about that. But today, and through my work in the last 10 years, I have tried to look at another part of the question. Uh, that is to look not only at that external role, but to look at energy relations from inside. And in particular, to stop thinking about the energy dependent countries as passive recipients of policies made in Moscow, but to look at the black box of domestic energy policy making in these countries and how what happens inside that black box helps us understand the relations in the region. So to do that, you look at winners and losers of different types of energy policies, governance, transparency, how energy policies and state energy policies are made or hijacked. Um, I have worked a lot on these topics. Um, I wrote three books about this, two of them will be published this year. Um, and of course, I cannot tell you everything I wrote in these books in, in, in half an hour, but uh, we could have many interesting discussions today and tomorrow. Um, and what my presentation today uh, tries to do is to focus on one aspect of my theoretical framework that is the question of the cycle of energy rents. How energy rents move through political systems and what does this mean? So what do I mean by energy rents? Well, when I try to understand the way energy politics have really worked in the first 20 years of independence for countries like Ukraine, Belarus, and Lithuania, trying to understand why, for example, a country like Ukraine couldn't really develop an energy policy that would allow it to move away from dependency on Russia. I realized that a crucial point is how different elites will deal with the distribution of the gains and losses of energy dependence. And to, this, to do this, I invented a little phrase the rents of energy dependency, that is, the profits that can be made also in a situation of energy dependency by a variety of players. Okay? Um, sometimes we talk about energy profits when we talk about the energy-rich countries, 
Well, for me, in the last 10 years, what has been important are the energy profits in the energy poor countries. And indeed, you can have quite a few domestic sources of energy rents, even in a situation of energy poorness, external sources as well, we can talk about later. Um, there are other factors that play a role, we can talk about that also later. Um, but today I want to emphasize only one aspect of this larger picture, and that is how these energy rents move within the system. The cycle of energy rents. Extraction, distribution, recycling of energy rents. And I would like to talk about this on the basis of the three countries I deal with in, in, in my book, uh, Ukraine, Belarus, and Lithuania. Three countries which had to face a huge change in their external conditions in 1992. Their change virtually overnight from being part of our energy-rich state, the Soviet Union, to becoming independent energy-poor countries. Um, so the first element of the equation has to do with the extraction of these energy rents. And if we look at this issue here, issues that are important are, are these domestic rents, are these external rents, what is their size, um, how easy is it to access these rents. And, and we see that in the case of Ukraine, for example, the trademark in the case of Ukraine was the huge uh, size, simply in terms of size of these rents, partly having to do with Ukraine's huge role as an energy importer, five, six largest energy importer, uh, gas importer in the world, but also Ukraine's role in energy transit, Ukraine's being the largest hydrocarbon transit country in the world. Um, in the case of Ukraine, this ended up leading to a situation where exactly the availability of these rents created a chain of events that made most energy actors in Ukraine, at least until 2006, not interested in moving away from dependency on Russia. In the case of Belarus, from the information we have available until now, we can talk mainly about external rents coming from the relationship with Russia. There is some nuance here, I understand. I just wrote another separate book on Belarus, so we can talk much more about rents now in Belarus, different types of rents. But uh, the importance uh, of energy rents in the case of Belarus is that uh, in per capita terms, energy rents in Belarus, external rents accrued from the relationship with Russia were much more higher than in the case of Ukraine or Lithuania. This is just a, an example. This is only having to do with gas, only with some years. But if you see, you have per capita value of potential rent pools uh, in Ukraine about five times larger than in Lithuania. We could discuss how I came up with these calculations, but the point is that per capita, those rents were much lower in the case of Belarus. Uh, in the case of Lithuania, in comparison, these rents, both in absolute terms and in per capita terms, were much more smaller. And as we will see later on, this would come to have an impact later on as well. Uh, the second part of the equation has to do with the distribution of these rents. Uh, how are these rents distributed domestically? Who are the main actors which are receiving these rents? What are the mechanisms through which these rents are distributed? In the case of Ukraine, especially between 1994, 2004, and the Kuchma period, access to these energy rents was very much related to the system of clans, or what I prefer to call the system of business administrative groups, which receive the possibility of rent seeking in exchange for certain political favors. Um, uh, however, in the case of Ukraine, we have to make clear that also non-system groups also had access to energy rents. If we look at the origins of the Orange Revolution, for example, we know that some of the political groups related to the Orange Revolution also had access to energy rents. Uh, this is important, especially when we compare uh, with Belarus. In the case of Belarus, um, we can talk about most energy rents accruing at a macro level, at the level of the state as a whole. Um, and this, the way these macro rents trickle down to society 
contributed on the one hand to keeping alive an economic system which otherwise would have probably collapsed, but also to increasing living standards and in this way uh, increasing the popularity of the president. In the case of Lithuania, the size of these trends, as I mentioned, was much smaller. Um, they were never very significant for, for example, Gazprom as a whole. They were important for some specific players within Gazprom, never for the company as a whole because of their size. And um, the local actors associated with these trends were much more or less powerful than in the case of Ukraine or Belarus. I'm talking, for example, about uh, Toyota Canada uh, and other gas distributors. The third element of the picture has to do with the recycling of these rents into the political system. Um, and here, the issue is not only who is benefiting from these rents, but how these rents come to, ref to refeed or be recycled into the political system. How is this going to affect further energy policy, but also further political development. And here there are three ways in which this can happen. Uh, this can happen through the creation or strengthening of specific political actors. This can happen through the impact of these trends in elections. And this can happen through their impact on policy making, especially energy policy making. In the case of Ukraine, uh, uh, what we have is a situation where the sheer impact of these huge energy rents exactly in the first years of independence actually led to the creation of a whole set of political actors which until today are the central political actors in the country. In terms of energy policy, in the case of Ukraine, the availability of these rents um, and the fact that vast amount of rents could be made through the continuation of energy policy led to a situation where both uh, managers of state-owned energy intensive industries, so-called red directors, emerging oligarchs and politicians, all of these actors could find a common interest in maintaining a system that through energy dependency allowed them to amass vast riches uh, in record time. Um, so the factual evidence of the Ukrainian case between 1994 and 2004, which I uh, studied in more detail, I wrote a separate book about that, uh, tells us that during this period, the real aims of Ukrainian energy policy had much more to do with the political need to distribute these threats among the necessary political groups than with real energy policy. In the case of Belarus, the recycling of energy rents um, has been very much associated with distributional issues. Um, for example, how those energy rents trickle down to the population as a whole through increased wages, increased access to consumer goods, including imported goods, in this way increasing Lukashenko's popularity, at least in the last year, and robbing the opposition of an important source of support. And in the case of Belarus, this led actually to an increase, and I would even say a conscious, conscious increase in energy dependency on Russia. In the case of Lithuania, again, because of the very different level of friends involved, the strength of political actors created by these energy rents was much smaller, and you certainly had actors that were supported by these energy rents, but not created, as in the case of Ukraine. So much more, less significant. So I would like to move to my conclusions. Uh, I need about five or uh, eight minutes for the conclusions. So what, I have, what have I learned? Uh, spending so many years uh, doing this very difficult research, reading thousands of pages of uh, novel Stephen Zokolonki in various languages. Uh, what can one learn from this? And I'm afraid some of these conclusions are not very politically correct. So, conclusion number one has to do with rent seeking and energy policy. And basically, what I have learned through all this research is that the existence, and most importantly, the easy, a 
accessibility of energy rent pools, including those coming from discounts, subsidies, preferential trade conditions from Russia, were a crucial factor contributing to energy insecurity and lack of proactive energy policies in these countries. In the cases of Ukraine and Belarus, where those energy rents were the largest, the effects were very serious in terms of hindering diversification away from Russia, at least until 2006. In the case of Belarus, indeed, dependency even consciously increased. In the case of Lithuania, where the rents available were smaller, it was actually easier to start moving, if only after 2008, uh, to a more proactive energy policy, which we are seeing today. My second conclusion has to do with the role of transit states. And I think what I have learned from uh, looking at these cases is that traditional understandings of the instruments or means of counter power available to transit states need to be reassessed. In the literature, when we look at what elements of counter power may transit states have, we often look at the infrastructure located in these transit states, their pipelines, their underground uh, gas storage facilities, and so on. But what we sometimes forget is that having this infrastructure is not enough. Uh, what I learned through all my research is that to the extent that this infrastructure becomes part of often corrupt rent-seeking games, the more difficult it becomes to use this infrastructure as a real and effective element of counter power vis-a-vis -vis the main supplier. Uh, if you look at the case of Ukraine, Ukraine, as one of the largest gas importers in the world, one of the largest gas markets in the world, as a country having a huge transportation and transit infrastructure, um, as a country having fantastic um, underground storage facilities, Ukraine's energy, uh, gas storage facilities account to 41% of its daily, of its, uh, sorry, of its yearly consumption. This is a dream compared to Belarus that has only 3%, compared to Lithuania that has 0%. Um, in theory, Ukraine could have used this kind of infrastructure to moderate its dependency, to have a different kind of balance vis-a-vis -vis Russia. But in reality, this infrastructure, in particular the uh, storage facilities, have been used mainly for the furthering of Gazprom's interest or for the benefit of intermediary companies such as Roskoker Energo, which, uh, to which use of these facilities has been provided uh, at prices much lower than international ones. Third conclusion, and this is one of my favorites. Um, actually, we should be very careful for what we wish for. And very often, even today, we are concentrating on low prices. We are talking about this danger of high prices. And what I learned through my research is that the factor, contrary to the views propagated by many or most politicians, an over-concentration on low, whatever that means, $50 per thousand cubic meters, 20, 18, 200, uh, an over-concentration securing low energy prices as an absolute goal was, in fact, one of the largest determinants of energy insecurity in the region. This has to do with many factors. This reduced incentives for conservation and domestic production. This led to lack of money for keeping the infrastructure in good shape. But what is more interesting for me is the political aspect. What we saw was a situation where the interest of certain economic elites, deeply ingrained popular beliefs, what I call Soviet energy culture, and the interest of populist politicians coincided with short term. So what we saw is a situation, what we see today, it's a situation where even when benefiting privately from deals, even corrupt deals, 
around their country's energy dependency, leading politicians in countries such as Ukraine publicly continued to pursue what could be called the instrumental securitization. Instrumental securitization of energy issues using the rhetoric of the dangers of energy poverty, the rhetoric of the dangers of energy dependency as a rhetorical device to satisfy external audiences, Western donors, for example, or the domestic voting public, but not really as a guide to actual policy. Thus, options such as the development of expensive alternative energy import infrastructure were taken off the table. Too expensive to build a new pipeline. But the overconcentration and low energy prices in the short term led to other solutions coming up on the agenda. Solutions, for example, as guaranteeing short term low prices through the role of intermediary companies. Um, number, conclusion number four. And many of the energy crises we have seen in the post Soviet period, and here, for example, the 2006 and 2009. Ukrainian Russian energy crisis were not, or at least not only, the result of unsolvable contradictions in the energy interests of both states, but of the intentional actions, such as the creation of what in the economics literature people often call artificial scarcities. So if you look at the way each of these crises developed, you can see crucial moments where some of the players heightened the stakes of the situation so that they could later extract larger benefits, or we see a situation where the situation was artificially um, uh, the, 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 the confrontational side of the situation was artificially heightened uh, for public relations and preemptive pressure purposes. So, yes, there are contradictions in the energy interest between these players, between these states, but when we look at the crisis, there is much more than simply a contradiction in this energy interest. The last conclusion has to do with the ways in which those energy conflicts between Russia and energy dependent states have been really managed. Really. Not in theory, but really. And when we look at the situation, we have seen that very often these conflicts were not managed through institutionalized negotiation mechanisms, but rather through the transborder of sharing, transborder sharing of rents between elites. Uh, the best example of this has to do again with the role of intermediary companies. Uh, if we look again at the story of the 2006 and 2009 confrontations, we look, uh, for example, at what really happened in those. Uh, late hours of January 3rd, 2006, in Moscow, during the negotiations between representatives of Ukraine and Gazprom, uh, when we see how suddenly the crisis was solved through the appearance, appearance of an intermediary company, which, in the words of a Ukrainian uh, former minister and uh, minister of energy, appeared as on a white horse, Kagnavirov Kanye, to solve the situation, but of course at the cost of higher rents for the intermediary company, then we see that there is still a huge lack, a huge need for developing workable energy governance and dispute resolution mechanisms in the post-Soviet area. And of course, the fact that they have not developed has a lot to do with the interests of some of the players involved that can gain much more through this kind of under the table solving of energy crisis than through real energy governance. Um, to wrap up uh, my whole presentation, I would like to simply uh, recapitulate what has been the main purpose of what I have tried to do today. What I have tried to do today is to contribute to an alternative framework for understanding energy relations in the post-Soviet area. Um, I do not deny that Russia uses energy for political purposes, that's a given but it's not enough to look only at this. Obviously, we need much more information and much more work on rents. We need to develop much more specific, 
and accurate definitions of what constitutes rents, how they work, uh, so that we can do better comparisons. But even having to rely on imperfect information, and if you do research on Ukraine and Belarus, you understand that you have to rely on imperfect information. Um, focusing on energy rents and their sources of extraction, distribution, and reincorporation still helps us to look at a lot of things that otherwise may have remained below our radar. Thank you very much.